Good morning, everyone. Great to be back with you guys. I've been gone a couple of weeks and I missed you. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Diane. Hey, it's great to be missed by at least one. Hey, um, we have a very exciting study in front of us. A lot to cover today. We're going to jump right into this. Uh, let me just say before we return to our study of the book of Acts, uh, you may remember we were going through Acts before we got into Christmas messages, but before we return to Acts, we're going to actually take some time, revisit our goal for the year, which we re, uh, you know, announced in September. We spent some time on the goal, and the goal was basically that uh, all of us as a family of believers who love God and love our neighbors, that we would love where you live with the wisdom of grace and truth. And so we spent some time kind of talking about the art of neighboring and like, how do you kind of, you know, initiate some relationships and, and start building friendships where you're really loving your neighbors. And, and we're, we're, we're all hopeful that in the process of loving our neighbors that we have an, a, an opportunity to share the gospel with them. Now, that's not the only reason why we're loving our neighbors. And it's not like we're, we're going to quit loving them if they aren't interested in the gospel. Like Jesus calls us to love our neighbors. In fact, remember, what he says to us, he says, our job is to love God and love our neighbors. Our God is to love him, love our neighbor as ourself. In fact, elsewhere, he says that all of the law could be reduced to the idea of love your neighbor as yourself. And so like, this is a big deal. Like This is something that we're not just doing for a year. This is who God calls us to be, that we're a family of believers who are committed to loving God and loving our neighbors. And so we want to love where we live. And in the process of that, what we're... Uh, uh, doing in their goal this year is trying to approach the question, how do we do that with grace and truth? How, how do we do that with the wisdom of grace and truth? Some of you remember we looked at Colossians chapter uh, 5, and uh, remember verse 5 and 6, or Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, and it, it said there that we should like walk with wisdom toward those who are outsiders. Outsiders were those outside of the faith. Uh, they were those who are far away from God. And he says that we should walk toward, in wisdom toward them. Let your speech be seasoned with salt so that you'll know how to answer all, all, all those who have questions. And so we're, we're kind of building this whole year around, like, how do we do that? And so this, uh, for the next uh, several weeks or so, we're, we're basically going to ask the question, how do we do that? And so we're looking at some questions that are kind of the trending questions. They're the trending topics that tend to kind of get pushed back at us when we start sharing the gospel, they're, they're kind of where our culture is. Like they have trouble with a number of things, five particular topics that I'll introduce to you later this morning. But we're going to kind of ask the question, how do we respond to them? First of all, with truth. And then second, how do we do it in a tone that is unnecessarily offensive? How do we do it in a way that Jesus would do it? With the kind of grace and love that attracted people to him, who were not kind of like among the religious, who were kind of more on the outside. How can we learn to do that? Well, today we're going to talk about that. We're going to, uh, by way of kind of introduction, this whole message today kind of introduces this series. I want you to turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 17. Because what we're going to observe here is that the Apostle Paul, who would normally enter a city, find a synagogue where, you know, the the, the Jews, the Hebrews, would worship God, and he would go in there and argue from the Scriptures, their Scriptures, from Isaiah and Psalms and the prophets. He would talk about how Jesus was the promised Messiah. But in Acts chapter 17, he finds himself addressing a completely different audience. They don't share a respect for the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, they're not coming from the same worldview, if you will, in that Paul has to kind of uh, recognize this change in his audience and address accordingly. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to say that, man, we, we've got to talk about worldviews. Now, before I begin, let me illustrate this for a moment. I, this is my favorite Far Side cartoon. If you've been with us in this church for a while, you've seen me use this because I think it's so, uh, so helpful. As you see, the, the pictures are all you know hung crooked on the walls, and you ask the question, well, what's going on? And then you look at the museum curator or the host here, and, and he's got a crick in his neck. He's, you know, he's, he's got his, his head bent in the same direction. And so to him, all the pictures are hanging straight, aren't they? But for those of us who are like, got your head you know, on this way, like you see like something's off. 
Well, worldview is basically the way you look at life. And here's the idea. The way you look at life impacts the way you live life. That's a principle we find throughout Scripture. The way you look at life, the way you think about life, the way you process life, like your, your, what you believe about life, it impacts like how you live your life. And what we're going to learn today is that if you only address how people are living, if you only address like, hey, you got some pictures in your life that are crooked, let me straighten them up for you that that will do a disservice. Because what we've got to do is start with the way people think and what they believe. We need to start with what we think and what we believe. Because it's when we address how people look at life, that impacts how they will live life. Now, So uh, Paul basically has to uh, address a different group of people who are looking through a different set of lenses at the world uh, than normally what he would find in a synagogue. And so we're going to find this described in uh, Acts chapter 17. Let me just read this passage, and then I'm going to make some observations from it. Follow along with me if you care. And uh, this is chapter 17 of Acts, verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. And so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? And others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. If people say that about my messages sometimes. Wow, that's really strange. Um, you bring some strange things to, uh, to our ears. Um, verse 21, Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, uh, the Romans later called this location Mars Hill, uh, if you're more familiar with that term, but you know it was an area where all the philosophers got together, and so Paul is like standing there. And when you visit that area, you can stand where he stood and kind of you know soak it in. But he says uh, to the men of Athens, "I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown god. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you." The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. All right, fascinating, fascinating presentation by the Apostle Paul. And uh, so what I want you to do is we're going to contrast a couple of worldviews here right now. One is theism, which was kind of the worldview that, uh, that Paul was coming from. And he's addressing a group of people who are coming from a point of view of polytheism. Okay, So we're going to, we're going to spend a couple of uh, minutes on this. Some of you are going to feel like you need to write all this, you know, this down. You can find these slides on our website if that helps you. 
But let me just define a worldview. A worldview is basically uh, how someone answers basic questions about life. It kind of summarizes, you know, a, a, a group's shared values, uh, beliefs. Uh, it, it's their assumptions about life. Uh, technically, a worldview would, would answer the following questions. Like, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about man? Good? Is man good or evil? Uh, what, what do you believe about uh, relationship between God and man? Uh, what do you believe about uh, um, how man should live? Uh, what do you believe about what happens after death? Like, the, a worldview would kind of have a, a take on all of those kinds of things. And so what, what Paul is doing is he's coming from a theistic worldview, which when he goes into the synagogue and he's talking to Jews, they have much, much in common. They have the same scriptures, their same belief uh, in, in God, and he, he interacts with them from their scriptures to show how Jesus was the promised son of God. But they have much, much in common. But as he finds himself on Mars Hill at the Areopagus, it's much different. Like, they're not coming from any kind of common place. And just kind of as a hint from where we're going, uh, where we're going this morning, is that we are interacting with a culture in, the, in America that is changing. Like, it's been changing, and then it's changing rapidly. And we need to understand kind of the worldview of our country as we interact with them as well. Because you, what are we doing? We love God and we love our neighbors. And so let's jump into this a little bit. Theism, first of all, when it comes to God, is they, they believe in one God. Theism believes in one God. Polytheism believes in many gods. As we read earlier, it said that Paul was provoked in his spirit because he walked through the city of Athens and saw all the different idols. And he, he talks later about all, uh, all their different religious views with all, all the different idols. Okay, theism uh, believes that God created man. But polytheism, basically man creates gods. All right, so Paul actually spends quite a bit of time where he talks about how God uh, made all things and that he made from one man all, all mankind. He, he kind of establishes this idea of, of, of how God created man. But in chapter 17, uh, he says later about these uh, on Mars Hill, he says, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. So in polytheism, basically man creates God out of art and imagination, wood, you know, stone, gold. Okay, so when he, another point of the, in the worldview here would be that in theism, truth is revealed by God. Like, how do you know what is true? Theism says that God has revealed himself to man and revealed truth. And so if we had the time, you know, we'd look at Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2, and we learn that God has revealed himself to all people generally. He's revealed himself through creation, and he's revealed himself internally through the conscience, like the moral law that he puts on the heart of people. And then we find out that God has also revealed himself specifically through the Scriptures, the Word of God, and through Jesus, the Logos, the Word of God, who was called the Word. Okay, so God reveals truth. Man receives truth revealed by God. Polytheists, that's not where they're coming from. In fact, they would say that, that truth is basically kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's religion. Truth is all, whatever religion, whatever God you follow, that's kind of your truth. Uh, very different. Uh, second, uh, fourth here, truth is objective and authoritative. So theism would say, okay, God has revealed truth, and it's objective. It doesn't really matter if I like it, if I agree with it. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. It's objective. It stands for itself. It's been revealed by God, independent of man. When people talk about how truth is absolute... That's kind of where they're coming from. They're saying in, in theism, truth is absolute because it's, it's objective and it is uh, authoritative. But polytheism, truth is local. In other words, depending on why, your particular God and why were they so interested in Paul, they said because he's talking about what? Some strange foreign divinities. Like that. So, you know, in other words, whoever your God is, that's your truth. 
And so that's kind of where they were coming from. Let me give you one more. When it comes to morality, like how someone should live, morality is determined by God as revealed through Scripture. Uh, theism is coming from that, that standpoint, that right or wrong, how God designed us to live comes from Him. He, he determines it. He defines it. But in polytheism, uh, basically they're coming from the idea that morality differs with each of the gods. So it's not like they're necessarily in contradiction, but each god kind of has their own special emphasis. And so you may have worship the god of fertility, you may worship the god of, you know, of weather, and god of the sun, you know, whatever. But it, it, it's different. Morality would differ with each of the gods. Now, that is a very different from what Paul was used to. And before I go into contrast where we are, I think, as a country, let me just tell you that what we observe here is that Paul is interested in getting to Jesus. And he does, doesn't he? He gets to Jesus. And he, he's kind of interacting with their culture. And he interacts with some of their popular culture. He quotes from some of their poets and philosophers, to kind of make his point, uh, you know, about that there is a God, this unknown God that you declare. There is a real God, and let me declare him to you. And he eventually does get to Jesus. And in our interactions about spiritual things, that's always our goal too, is that we want to learn to interact in a way where that helps us get to Jesus. And that's what, what happens here. Well, let, let's talk about kind of, you know, where we are as a country. And what I want to do is, is generally just give a general label of secularism. Secularism is kind of the, the worldview that our country is moving toward. Some would say we're already there. We're moving fast towards secularism. Uh, some parts of our country are perhaps further along than other parts of our country. But that very quickly, uh, we have in the last six decades been moving towards secularism, and it seems the pace is picking up. All right, so for many, many years of our country, up till like, say, the 1950s or so, uh, especially the 1960s, things started really rapidly changing, that we were coming from a theistic kind of uh, a point of view, a theistic kind of world view. Now, let me qualify this. I don't mean to say that everybody at that time were like, born again, evangelical Christians, like they're hard followers of Christ. What I'm saying is that there was generally in the mind view of our country that we're kind of a, a you know, a Christian country. Like if they say, well, what religion are you? Well, you, you would say, I'm, I'm Christian. I live in America. Uh, th there was more of a nominal identification with Christianity. There was respect for the Bible. Now, you may not follow the Bible or, or, or uh, obey the Bible, but there was generally respect for the Bible, church, um, some sense that, you know, that God was good. And that just was kind of general feelings. It was kind of the, the pervasive mindset. Well, in the 1960s, when we started questioning authority and that liberal theology had undermined the Bible, and we started embracing kind of whole, all new ideas. And you take that and you fast forward it and you get to this place where we're going to describe now as secularism. Now, even there, at, at the risk of confusing here, even when you talk about secularism, you could break it down between modernism and postmodernism. And I'm not going to spend time doing that right now, but I'm just trying to illustrate that, that when I talk about moving towards secularism, it's kind of a complicated, multi-level kind of thing. And so I'm giving you kind of some general ideas. Move to secularism, some would say, would be post-Christian America. Like no longer would we go, well, I live in America, so I'm Christian. Uh, less and less and less and less people today would, would say that or feel that way. And more and more and more people are not identifying with any kind of religion. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're moving increasingly towards secularism. Well, well, what is secularism? Let's look at it real quick. Okay, so we said the, this first category about belief in God, theism, belief in one God. Secularism would believe in no God or at the most kind of a nominal belief in God. And by nominal, I think you understand it's just that it's not really personal. It doesn't really impact my life. It's just kind of, you know, it's just a real nominal association with God. 
So at the very best, it, it, it's that. But for, for many people moving hard and fast towards secularism, it's no belief in God. God doesn't exist. And just to illustrate here a little bit more, is that for many of us, we've all known atheists or you know, people who, you know, I, no, I don't believe in God, but they, they were somewhat passive about it. But today, it's very aggressive that the atheists today are now you know, putting on campaigns to try to convince people not to believe in God. They're much more aggressive about their no belief in God. Okay, that's, that's secularism. Okay, the second thing is about uh, not belief in God, but about uh, creation, where obviously theism, God created man. Uh, secularism, they would deny creation. Okay, so they would ascribe to what we would call naturalism, uh, you know, atheistic evolution, naturalistic evolution, that whatever happened to bring to get us here, like it had nothing to do with God. God was not involved in it, in it at all. It just happened naturally through different processes. Okay, when it comes to truth, theism, truth is revealed by God, but with secularism, influenced by the Enlightenment, in fast-forwarding, basically it's all about reason. Okay, so it's not God revealing to man what is true. It's man reasoning together to discover what is truth. And so science is very important because in the enlightened mentality, the secularist mentality, all of reality is confined to materialism. What is material? There is no immaterial, spiritual, supernatural, miracles, it's just what I can see, hear, taste, touch, you know, the five senses. Okay, so uh, that's how they, they view truth. Truth is uh, to be reasoned toward. Uh, regarding uh, truth, we say theism, that truth is objective and authoritative. Okay, it's objective and authoritative. But for secularism, truth is subjective and it's relative. And which is why we embrace in our country pluralism so passionately. Because we have now come to see that truth is not objective. Truth is what you think it is, which may be different from what you think it is. And it's okay. Because what is true is true to you, baby. And what's true to me is true to me. And so, man, you go, well, I'm, I'm glad that you found something that works for you because that's truth for you. And even though they can be completely diametrically opposed to each other, we affirm them both. Listen, that is a big change. And so secularism really embraces that. And so it's relative. So like what you think you ought to do in terms of morality in one situation is different from what I think. And hey, you, you decide what's true for you and you do it. And, it, and it's subjective. Okay, uh, here's another facet of this with postmodernism. With modernism, it, it used to be the idea that, well, it needed to be, you know, driven by reason, uh, logic. But in postmodernism, those things aren't necessarily true anymore. It's more about, well, how do I feel about it? And what is, what is my experience? And there's also a relational component where, you know, I like you. I think you're cool, so I'm going to kind of buy into whatever you believe. I'm relationally attracted, so I'm, I'm going to like assume your beliefs. It's really kind of, it's very different. Uh, let me give you a, a, one more here. How about uh, re regarding morality? We said morality was defined by God, but in secularism, morality is defined by the government. Or at least by the majority, which in our context, the, the majority influences government. And so I think all of this kind of, you know, we were aware of it and we were sensing it, but then, you know, when the Supreme Court passes the decision to redefine marriage, uh, that, you know, in, in other words, it, it approved, gives approval, actually gives legality to same-sex marriage in our country, I think many of us kind of woke up and went, wow. Like, wow, that's, we, we've come a long way, baby. And people started responding to that and like, how did, how did we get there? Now, <clears throat> I'm not necessarily going to argue like that everyone representing theism has been completely right in their positions. That's not what I'm saying, as you're going to hear. But the theistic point of view basically comes from a high regard of the Bible as truth. A belief in God, that he's revealed himself, and that God's defined like what life is, is like. So secularism kind of uh, moves away from that in some big ways. 
Now, <clears throat> what I want to do now is give some attention to how do we respond to this? Because you know, people have been very upset about this. And so uh, some people uh, rejoice in some of the changes they see, but then they're upset because there's not enough change. And others say, well, uh, they're upset because of the changes that are happening. And, and so that they're, they're not like, you know, at peace about all this. And in the midst of all this tension, we're trying to say God loves you. And so do I. And many, many times, my friends, there is a huge disconnect. And so uh, there are basically four things that we cannot do when we ask the question, how do we try to have influence and how do we relate? How do we live in a world that has really moved far away from theism to secularism? And one of the things we cannot do is simply to try to maintain control. Be the first thing. Control is the idea that where the church once was the epic center for all the what are the right values and cultural beliefs and assumptions, like the church had like major influence. And as we feel like that was starting to slip away, uh, some of you, if you were around in the 1980s and the moral majority tried to kick in and take control because, man, if we can get a hold of governmental power and political power, we can, from the top down, kind of impose upon the rest of the country our values, our moral positions, all these kinds of things. And, and we really, really sought to do that. And it really didn't work. And what's interesting about it is, in, in case you haven't recognized it, uh, most sociologists are today saying that, that the evangelicals have lost the cultural wars. And it may not be so bad for us because in the midst of trying to influence our culture, mainly politically, we, have, we were at risk of winning the battle but losing the war. Because what does it feel like to have someone politically, legally, like force you to try to into a mold, some kind of faith position, where you're not really there? And so for the unbelieving world, uh, they responded with resentment. And we understand that, don't we? That they could respond to resentment with, with us trying to power up on them, with the church trying to power up and trying to control them. And their, their response was resentment. You know, mom had a little boy, and she says to the little boy, you need to sit down. And a little boy says, no. And she says, you need to sit down right now. The little boy says, no. And she walks over there to that little boy and puts her hand firmly on her shoulders and sit down. And the little boy says, I may be sitting down on the outside. <laughs> but I'm standing up on the inside. Something that Jesus never did, though he certainly had the right to, is to force people or control people into responding to him. That is not how he influenced. He did not lead a moral reformation movement. And one of the things I think that, you know, the fact that maybe we, we've lost kind of political control, or, you know, I, maybe that's okay. Because it's, it, it's not really working for us to try to influence the culture through control. There's another response that we shouldn't follow, and that's what I would just call condemnation. See, once you, you kind of lose control, you feel like, hey, we're no longer the dominant influence, we're no longer shaping the culture, that we would sit back, and now instead of un outsiders being resentful, we're resentful. And so we sit back and we start saying things like, Man, I can't believe we're, 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 we've lost our country. Like, where did our country go? This was our country. And now it's all different. Like, it was our country. And so now we just want everyone to know how upset we are with them. And, and so we, we use language in our social media. We, we use language in the, how we interact with people that's very condemning. Let me, let me tell you what I think about this. And, and we're all uh, 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 about what, uh, what we're against. We're not really talking about what we're for, which is a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about what we're against. And like, I'm angry about it. 
that's not how we're going to influence anybody. You know, I used to kid my sons who both went to Texas A&M, don't hold it against them. Kathy and I went to UT, and, and so uh, I would always kid them because their, their whole fight song was about, you know, goodbye Texas University. And even now that they're in the SEC, their the fight song is still the same. Like, they, they sing about a school that's they're not even in their conference, but their whole identity, I used to say to them, I know this is true that don't get up, don't send me a lot of angry emails, but from you Aggies, but okay, but but basically their whole existence was well, here's what we're against. I mean, we're against Texas University. And for many people, they view us as the church as primarily only what we're against. We are condemners. And we're resentful with the direction the church the country is going. And we feel like, hey, it's our country and you're robbing it from us. Let me tell you, Christian father of Jesus Christ, this world is not your home. Your allegiance is to Jesus Christ, and we wait for him to return. Because our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians chapter 4. And listen, our job is to influence people by sharing the gospel. Telling them the good news of what Jesus has done. And that's going to involve truth and grace. It's going to involve grace and truth. And so uh, we don't want to just kind of be controllers. We don't want to be condemners. The third thing that we don't want to do is simply kind of close off. You know, just shut down. You know, where the idea is that we're just going to retreat into the monastery, the holy huddle. You know, it's our four and no more. We're not going to engage with culture because we're so upset with the direction of the country. Like, I don't even want to interact with them. They're so bad. They're bad, bad, bad. And so, man, let's just kind of get a couple of friends and some family, and let's just hide out. Maybe Jesus will come back tomorrow. Uh, that's not, that, that's not a, a posture that the church took in the New Testament. And even though there was this anticipation of Jesus' return and a desire to see Jesus return, and I certainly relate to that, but there wasn't this idea of retreating, of, of, of uh, you know, just kind of, resignation or resignment. And the fourth one that we don't want to do is obviously compromise. Compromise is the idea that, well, you can't beat them, might as well join them. Compromise is the idea that, well, you know what, um, it's kind of hard to live counterculturally because you get into odd or sometimes it feels like uh, awkward conversations and I don't like to do that and I don't know what to say and so I'm just going to go, you know what, the peer pressure just like our high schoolers face, our middle schoolers face in school, we kind of face that out in the marketplace, out in the secular world. We just say, well, we're just going to go along to get along. And so we just kind of compromise. Uh, George Barna of the Barna Research Company said that among evangelical born-again Christians, and they define that very speci uh, specifically, like to the, to the degree where they would go, those who have assurance they're going to heaven because they have repented of their sins and placed their faith alone in Christ alone as their Lord and Savior. Like it's real defined. He says among that group, only 32% believe that truth is absolute. Some of us just compromise and re resign. Well, neither, neither of those work real well. The, 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 what will work is learning how to relate. Uh, it, you know, it's not retreating, it's not resigning, it's not re being resentful. It's learning how to relate to people with love. Jesus, we're told, came with grace and truth. And that that's the way he related to people in a winsome way that never compromised truth, but was always uh, 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 punctuated, was always seasoned with incredible grace of God. And that is what we have to do as well. So here's what we're going to do with this series. Okay, we're going to hit some topics. And let me show you what they are. We're going to talk about the topics of religion, uh, so that when you're talking to people and they, they see a movement towards spiritual things, and they go, oh man, I, I'm, not into, you know, I'm not into religion. In fact, I believe most of the evil in the world today is a result of religion, especially organized religion. So I don't, I don't want... So when you hear that, like, how do you respond to that? What truth would apply to that from the word? What would grace look like? Uh, same, uh, second would be same-sex marriage, where people would just want to know, like, what, do you, what do you guys believe about same-sex marriage? 
That is the new litmus test for many, many of our gay friends and family. Like, in other words, if they're looking, if they're interested spiritually, they want to know, like, what do you guys believe about that? Okay, so what is the truth about that for, uh, for followers of Christ? And how do we relate to people who are outside of the faith when they raise that question? Third uh, issue we're going to address is science. So many people think that uh, Christianity is incompatible with uh, science. The, the two are, are, are completely diverse from each other. So how to respond to that? Fourth is suffering. Okay, one of the major pushbacks when you talk to people about a loving God. You know, so you spent time in Iraq and Afghanistan and you saw the carnage over there. You see what's going on in the streets of our major cities. You suffered abuse growing up. Like people want to know, like, how, if God is so loving, how in the world did that happen? Like, how do we respond to that with truth and grace? And then finally, or we're going to talk about Jesus uh, being the only way to the Father. And in our, uh, you know, in our state of pluralism and tolerance, like, people really push back about that. How could Jesus be the only way? So how, how do we respond to that with grace and truth? So that's where we're going uh, with the series. Um, we're going to, with each message, kind of identify what's the tension you know, around this topic. Why is this hard? Uh, you know, what's going on in our culture about this? And then we're going to spend some time talking about truth. And then we'll spend some time talking about tone. What is grace uh, look like here. And I'll just quickly, very quickly give you a preview that humility and hope is what has to kind of season the tone. Like part of the, the salty response is both the idea of humility and hope. And I'll, I'll be going into more detail on that. Uh, a little girl, uh, the story is told, uh, once was praying, her dad overheard her, and, and she said, God, Will you please make bad people good and make good people nice? Because it hasn't always been that way. People who have been coming from kind of a biblical idea have many times been very judgmental, very hypocritical, very condemning, not much grace. And let me tell you, what the world needs now is to hear about the love of God expressed with real grace and truth. If someone says, coming from a same-sex marriage point of view, someone said, well, what do you guys believe about same-sex marriage? The first thing I would want to go is, well, let me tell you before I respond. That when it comes to God's standards of biblical marriage, I don't think I've ever met them. <laughs> I think that I've, I've failed living up perfectly to God's standards in the area of biblical marriage. In fact, the Bible says oh, we all have. So in other words, before we go any further, let's just set the playing field. Like what characterizes the moral life of man is failure. That's why we need a Savior. That's why Jesus died. That's why we need His Spirit within us, because we can't in our own resources live a righteous life. That's humility. It's not even true. It's not even humble, but it's true. And so how we respond to people, if all they hear or see or feel is condemnation, we are not being like Jesus. So we have an exciting study in front of us. I know I've gone late. We don't have time. I'm sorry, John David. We bring in a guest, worship leader, and then we, 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 we cut him out. Uh, sorry, sorry I'm late, but glad to be back. And we got an exciting study in front of us. Let's all stand up and uh, <clears throat> stand up together. Let me ask our elders who are in the service to come forward. And uh, if their wives are with them, please to come. And if you're new here, we do this so that people uh, can, after we're dismissed, people can come forward and just have someone to share a, 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 any kind of problem or, you know, let us pray for you about any kind of issue going on in your life. Or you may just have some general questions and we're available to be helpful in that way. If you're brand new to the church, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, next week, you might consider coming a little bit early at, uh, 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 for a newcomer reception at 1030. And in fact, you might want to consider coming to this uh, class called Starting Point, which meets at 915, which is just kind of our first step into the life of the church. 
It's a great opportunity for you to meet some people who are brand new, just like you. And the material is great. The leaders are great. That's that same room down in, uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, 116. Been gone two weeks and you start forgetting everything. 116, room 116. So I encourage you to give thought to that. Uh, let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for our time together, Lord. We thank you, thank you for your love for us. And Lord, we just acknowledge in agreement with your word that if it were not for your grace, if it were not for your initiative, Lord, that we would never uh, come in, 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 into a relationship with you, to be connected with you. And that, Lord, despite the fact that most of the world believes that you have to kind of work your moral way to get to God, we learn that it's not about what we do. It's about what you did for us. That, Jesus, you died to pay the penalty for our sin. And everyone who believes that, that Christ, that you purchase our forgiveness, we have forgiveness of our sin and freedom from guilt. And that you make us your child and you promise all of that up front. And that then we live a life of enjoying uh, just fellowship and communion with you. Thank you for your word, uh, Lord, that gives us direction. And Lord, pray that you would bless this series to help us uh, to live effectively in a way to love uh, people in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.